little bit from the vacationers. Um, so the book is about an American family on a two-week vacation in Mallorca, Spain. And um, I think what I'm going to read to you is sort of will introduce you to, to the whole family and their assorted add-on friends and uh, lovers who have joined them in this house. Uh, I should say in advance, I speak no Spanish. And there are some Spanish words here, so if you are fluent in Spanish, I'm sorry in advance <laughs> um, for my pronunciation problems. Uh, yeah, okay, so I, I, you don't really need to know much. Um, Jim and Franny Post are the couple. They've just celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary, but things are not going so well for them. And they're uh, going to Spain with their 18-year-old daughter, Sylvia, their 28-year-old son, Bobby, and his girlfriend, Carmen, uh, and their very good friends, Charles and Lawrence, who are a married couple. Uh, and that's what you need to know. They're coming from the Upper West Side uh, of Manhattan, and here they are in Spain. The house was in the foothills of the Tramontana Mountains. See, that's probably not how you say that. <laughs> on the far side of the town of Puypuinant, on the winding road that would event eventually lead to Valdemossa. No one could pronounce Puypuinant, the car rental agent had said something like that, unrepeatable with an American tongue. And so when Sylvia insisted on calling it Pigpen, Jim and Franny couldn't correct her in Pigpen it was. Mallorcan Spanish wasn't the same as proper Spanish, which wasn't the same as Cabalan. Franny's plan was to ignore the differences and just plow ahead. It was how she usually got along with foreign countries. Unless you were in France, most, most people were delighted to hear you try and fail to form the right words. Franny and Sylvia stared out opposite windows, Franny in the front and Sylvia in the back while Jim drove. It was only 25 minutes from the airport, but that seemed to be true only if you knew where you were going. Gemma, who they were renting the house from, was one of Franny's least favorite humans on the planet for a number of reasons. Number one, she was Charles' second closest female friend. Two, she was tall and thin and blonde, three automatic strikes. Three, she'd been shipped off to boarding school outside Paris and spoke perfect French, which Franny found profoundly show-offy, like doing a triple axel at the Rockefeller Center skating rink. Heading up the mountain, Jim took several wrong turns on roads that looked too narrow to be two-way streets and not just someone's well-paved driveway, but no one particularly minded because it gave them a better introduction to the island. Majorca was a layer cake, the gnarled olive trees and spiky palms, the green gray mountains, the chalky stone walls along either side of the road, the cloudless pale blue sky overhead. Though the day was hot, the mugginess of New York City was gone, replaced by unfiltered sunshine and a breeze that promised you'd never be too warm for long. Majorca was summer done right, hot enough to swim, but not so warm that your clothing stuck to your back. Franny laughed when they pulled into the gravel drive, so drastically had Gemma undersold her house, another reason to despise her, modesty. In the distance, there were proper mountains with ancient tree trees ringing the slopes like Christmas ornaments, and the house itself looked like an actual present, two stories tall and twice as wide as their limestone at home. It was a sturdy-looking stone building painted a light pink. It glowed in the mid-morning sunlight, the black shutters on the open windows, eyelashes on a beautiful face. A good third of the house's front was covered with rich green vines, which crept across from edge to edge, threatening to climb into the windows and consume the house entirely. Tall, narrow pine trees lined the edge of the property, their tippy tops poking at the wide and empty sky. It was a child's drawing of a house, a large square with an angled roof on top, colored in with some ancient terracotta crayon that made the whole thing the back of the house was even better. The swimming pool, which had looked merely serviceable in the single backyard photograph, was in fact divine, a wide blue rectangle tucked into the hillside. A cluster of wooden chaise lounges sat at one end, as if the posts had walked in on the conversation already in progress. Sylvia hurried behind her mother, holding on to the sides of her tunic like a horse's reins. From the lip of the pool, they could see other houses tucked into the side of the mountain, as small and perfectly shaped as monopoly pieces, their gleaming faces poking out from a blanket of shifting green trees and craggy rocks. The ocean was somewhere on the other side of the mountain, 
another ten minutes west, and Sylvia huffed in the fresh air, sniffing for salt particles. There was probably a university in Majorca, at the very least a swimming and tennis academy. Maybe she would just stay and let her parents go home alone and do whatever had to be done. If she was on the other side of the world, what difference would it make? For the first time in her life, Sylvia envied her brother's distance. It was harder to mourn something you weren't used to seeing on a daily basis. Jim left the bags in the car and found the front door, which was oversized, heavy, and unlocked. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the relative dark. The house's foyer was empty except for a console table on the left-hand side, a large mirror hanging on the wall, and a ceramic pot the size of a small child. Hello, Jim called out, even though the house was supposed to be empty, and he wasn't expecting an answer. In front of him, a narrow hall led straight to a door to the garden, and he could see a sliver of the swimming pool backed by the mountains. The house smelled of flowers and earth with the soups on of cleaning products. Bobby would like that when he arrived. Ever since he was a child, when Jim and Franny would drag him along on their trips to Maine and New Orleans or wherever, staying in crumbling vacation houses with mismatched forks, Bobby made his disgust for the unclean known. He detested antique furniture and vintage clothing, anything that had had a previous life. It was why he liked Florida real estate so much, Jim thought. Everything was always brand new. Even the gigantic piles in Palm Beach were gutted every few years, their insides replaced with shinier parts. Florida suited Bobby in a way that New York never had, but he wouldn't mind this either, at least not for two weeks. Jim walked through the archway on his left into the living room. As in the photos, it was stylishly under-furnished with only two low sofas and a nice rug with paintings on the walls in places where the sun wouldn't hit them directly. Gemma was an art dealer or a gallerist or something. Jim's vague understanding was that she had so much money that a strict job description was superfluous. The living room led into the dining room with a long wooden farm table and two rustic-looking benches, which in turn led to the large kitchen. The windows above the sink looked out onto the pool, and Jim paused there. Sylvia and Franny were lying on neighboring cheeses. Franny had unwrapped her shawl from her shoulders and placed it over her face. Her sleeves were rolled up, and her legs splayed out to the sides. Sides. She was sunbathing, albeit with most of her clothes on. Jim exhaled with satisfaction. Franny was already having a good time. To say that Franny had been uptight in the preceding month would be too delicate, too demure. She had been re ruling the post house with an iron sphincter. Though the, the, though the trip had been meticulously planned in February, month before, months before Jim's job at the magazine had slid out from under him, the timing was such that Fran could be counted on to have one red face scream per day. The zipper on the suitcase was broken. Bobby and Carmen's flights booked on post frequent flyer points was costing them hundreds of dollars in fees because they had to shift the flights back a day. Jim was always in the way and in the wrong. Franny was expert in showing the public her good face, and once Charles arrived, it would be nothing but petting and cooing, but when she and Jim were alone, Franny could be a demon. Jim was grateful that at least for the time being, Franny's horns seemed to have vanished back into her skull. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to introduce you to the friends that are meeting. Charles Lawrence. Uh, this is the next morning. It's coming. <clears throat> when Lawrence ducked into the men's room, Charles leaned against the terminal wall of the airport, pulled his wheeled suitcase so that it rested against his feet and shut his eyes. They left their house in Provincetown at 3 o'clock the previous afternoon in order to get to Boston Logan for their evening flight and flying coach was more exhausting than he remembered. Lawrence was the thrifty one. If Charles had come alone, had come alone, he would have sprung for business class at the very least. He was 55 years old. What was he saving the money for if not for transatlantic flights? Lawrence would have scolded him had he been able to hear Charles' thoughts. This was a conversation they had on an extremely regular basis. Just because a baby hadn't come along yet didn't mean that one wouldn't. And then wouldn't he feel guilty about those thousands of wasted dollars floating over an ocean? Weren't organic apples, private school, tennis lessons worth it? They were, they were, Charles would always agree, even though he had lately come to believe that their shared dreams of having a family would soon go the way of the dodo, at which point they would resume their happily selfish lives. Almost all of the other couples they'd met at the adoption agency already had their babies, one if not two, 
and Charles thought there might be something written in invisible ink in their letter to the birth mothers. I'm conflicted, maybe, or I don't know, do we look like good parents to you? The terminal smelled like disinfectant and heavy perfume, a mixture that gave Charles a headache on the spot. He shifted his body to the right so that he was facing the stream of disembarking travelers. The Spanish ones had better faces than the tourists, better cheekbones, better lips, better hair. When he was young, Charles would paint from life, but now he just snapped photos with his digital camera and painted from those. He loved that freedom, being able to have anyone's face in his pocket. Hey, Lawrence said. He wiped his wet hands on his pants. Welcome back, Charles said. He leaned his head against Lawrence's shoulder. I'm tired. I know you are, but hey, at least you're not wearing an adult-sized play suit, he said, gesturing to a woman walking out of the jet bridge at the gate opposite the bathroom. She was small, probably not much over five feet, with soft pink terrycloth sweatpants and matching sweatshirt, both of which were snug enough to show off her round bottom and otherwise compact figure. Weren't those outlawed a decade ago? <laughs> the woman stepped out of the line of traffic and turned around, waiting for someone. A tall man with a moppish head of brown curly hair emerged, nodding at the waiting woman in pink. Charles spun around so that he was facing the wall. Oh shit, he said, it's Bobby's girlfriend. Not the one in the play suit. Lawrence said, turning his body so that they were both, both facing the wall. We can't both be pointing this way, Charles said. Shit. <laughs> Charles? Charles and Lawrence both turned around, arms open wide. Hi, they said in unison. Bobby and his girlfriend had shortened the gap between them and were now mo no more than four feet apart. Away. Hello, handsome, Charles said, pulling Bobby close for a hug. They had they patted each other on the back affectionately, and when he pulled out of the embrace, Bobby kept one arm slung over Charles' shoulder as if they were posing for a team photo. How was your flight? Hi, Lawrence. Bobby smiled widely. He had the easy tan of a person who spent most of his days outdoors, though that wasn't the case. Lawrence thought Bobby might in fact look too tan, as driving around real estate properties in Miami wouldn't afford so much sunlight unless he drove a convertible, which seemed unlikely. Maybe he spent every weekend on the beach, his face and arms and chest slathered in tanning lotion like some 1975 bodybuilder. That seemed unlikely, too. Lawrence wasn't quite sure how to reconcile himself to the fact that Bobby's golden brown suntan was almost certainly fake. The rules were different in Florida. Fine, how about yours, Charles said. No one had spoken to Bobby's girlfriend, nor had there been any effort to introduce her. Charles knew they'd met once or twice at a Christmas dinner at one of Franny and Jim's large, large parties. Maybe it was their 30th anniversary five years ago now. Charles had a dim recollection of seeing this woman standing next to Franny's literary agent, assiduously adjoin, uh, avoiding conversation by performing an extremely thorough investigation of the ceiling. The girlfriend was at least a decade older than Bobby, which was what had made her sweatsuit, sweatsuit so absurd. She was almost Lawrence's age, young only as viewed from the other side of 60. Franny had a lot to say on the matter, but only after half a bottle of wine. Until then, she remained coldly impartial. They'd been together for years, off and on, but none of the posts seemed to care one way or the other, at least in polite company, the way one might ignore the flatulence of an otherwise friendly dog. <laughs> Charles couldn't believe that he didn't remember her name. She was native to Miami with Cuban parents. Was it Carrie? It wasn't Mary. Miranda? Carmen was so excited we didn't sleep at all, Bobby said, finally looking over his shoulder to find her. You remember Charles and Lawrence, right? Hello, she said, reaching out her hand. Lawrence shook it first, then Charles. Carmen had a firm grip, a handshake that surprised them both. She had olive-colored, creaseless skin that belied her age and a ponytail that looked must from the airplane, an off-center whale spout. Lawrence thought she looked like one of the Spice Girls after a decade out of the spotlight, slightly worse for the wear. Of course, Charles said. How could we forget? Thank you.